until this point in time, we have made an assumption, right? It was really an implicit assumption, which is that when we look at a slice of a patient, let's say, and we talk about imaging right, different tissue components, and as, as Larry was just bringing up, one of the issues, for example, is that due to innate variabilities in the static magnetic field, that different populations of spins might actually be precessing at different frequencies because there's some variability, because of this variability in the static magnetic field. One thing that is actually implicit in the assumption that we can use a spin echo to refocus that magnetization, meaning we have two groups of spins that precess at different frequencies because right, blue and red see different amounts of magnetic field strength. So therefore, they will lose signal since the blue ones are precessing faster. The 180-degree RF pulse reorganizes them, rearranges them, so that as those blue spins continue to process at a faster rate, they come back into phase. That's the spin echo. Well, we have to assume, or it has to be the case, that these spins don't change their location during that process, meaning they don't move to other parts of the magnetic field that might have different magnetic field strength. Is that clear what I'm saying? So the assumption in everything we've talked about right now is that when we look at tissue, that it is not moving, that it's static, that everything stays in the same place. And of course, the reality, especially when you look at a living human subject, is that that's not the case. So as the you know, kind of simplest example, if we have a patient who is lying down in the scanner. We know that <clears throat> there is going to be all kinds of motion in tissue. And for now, for today, we're going to talk about relatively large-scale motion, such as flow within arteries and veins. So in this person, for example, we know that there is blood flowing in their vena cava that goes from feet to head. And if we would look at a slice like this, so let's make some kind of diagram of a slice of the, of this person's abdomen. Right? So they have different organs in here, but the thing that we're interested in is this pipe, right, which I chose as an example because it's basically running from foot to head. And let's make an assumption that it is, for our purposes here, that it's running exactly perpendicular to the slice that we're talking about. So in this location, as opposed to all of the tissue around it, the spins are not staying in the same place during the time that we're imaging. So if we think about a pulse sequence and what might be happening during this period of time, let's say a spin echo pulse sequence. So we have a 90 degree and a 180 degree RF pulse. And then at some time over here, we're going to sample the signal. And we have all our gradient magnetic fields and everything else going on. So if we look at some piece of supposedly stationary tissue, like in the liver, we know that those spins see the 90 degree RF pulse. 
that there is some dephasing of those spins due to T2 star, right, variability in the static magnetic field, that we reorganize, we reorient those spins with a 180 degree RF pulse, and if we wait the same amount of time, they come back into phase at TE. So the signal at TE is enhanced by the presence of the 180 degree RF pulse. What about the spins that are in the IVC? That are flowing from the patient's feet to the patient's head. So and here's our slice. So at the moment that we turn on our RF, there are spins in the IVC that are no different, right? Blood, for our purposes, is essentially no different than any other soft tissue, right? If we had a, a test tube of human blood and a test tube of homogenized human liver and we scanned them both at the same time, for our purposes, they would have approximately the same signal amplitude. You know, their T1 and their T2 are not, are not that dramatically different, at least as far as what we're trying to discuss right now. But what is different, so what's not different rather, is that when we apply this 90 degree RF pulse, right, both the, right, the blood and the stationary spins are tipped into the transverse plane, and we have this similar amount of transverse magnetization or signal amplitude for both of them. Okay? Now, as we move along in our pulse sequence, it may be that the flow velocity is sufficiently slow so that at the time that we give our 180 degree RF pulse, and we know by the way that these are both slice selective RF pulses. So if the velocity is sufficiently slow, then those spins are sort of percolating along and when time comes, several milliseconds later, it's not a very long time to give this 180 degree RF pulse, that both the stationary tissue, which hasn't moved, and the flowing spins, which have just sort of moved through the Z direction of the slice, will see that 180 degree RF pulse be equally refocused, and they'll both be detected in this signal, and they'll look about the same. Okay, what happens though if the velocity of the flowing blood is fast enough so that during this period of time between the 90 degree RF pulse and the 180 degree RF pulse, all of the spins that were in the slice in this location at the time of the 90 degree RF pulse are now, you know, somewhere in the head. And they have been replaced by other flowing blood spins that came up from around the knees or something like that. So what that means is at the time that we apply this 180 degree RF pulse, it's slice selective. Okay. The spins that have transverse magnetization created by this 90 are no longer in the slice. They no longer are precessing at the same frequency as other spins in this slice when we apply this 180 degree RF pulse. And therefore they never see the effect of this 180 degree RF pulse. So the stationary spins, we generated some signal, right? There was some signal loss due to T2 star, which was then recovered by that 180 degree RF pulse. Whereas the flowing spins, we generated some signal. There was some signal loss during this period of time with T2 star, they never see that 180 degree RF pulse and continue to relax with T2 star. So there's now a dramatic difference in the amount of signal amplitude between these two populations of spins. This is proportional to the velocity because as we just said, if the flow is slow enough, then those spins may very well stay in the slice and see both the 90 and the 180.
as the velocity goes up, it becomes increasingly likely that we are not going to affect our flowing spins with both the 90 and the 180. And therefore, the signal detected from those flowing spins goes down. Right? Which is why this is called right, high velocity signal loss. Okay. What imaging parameter might affect the likelihood that we're going to see this type of high velocity signal loss? TE, how? TE determines the time point that your 180 degree pulse is implemented. Right, or in other words, as our TE gets longer, the time between the 90 and the 180 gets longer. Because remember, the 180 has to be symmetrically placed between the 90 and TE. So as our TE gets longer, this time, right, between the 90 and the 180 gets longer, and the likelihood for a given flow velocity that our flowing spins will see both the 90 and the 180 is going to go down. So this effect of high velocity signal loss, which is commonly, I see this all the time, that's not what people call it. People call these the famous flow voids. What do you guys always say in the reports? The, the flow voids are intact or present or something like that. So I don't know what that means. I mean, flow void to me sounds like there's no flow. All right, it's really, it's signal void or it's a lower signal due to the presence of flow. Okay, but whatever they're called, right, hopefully you won't call them this, but whatever they are, you would expect the appearance to be much more dramatic on an image that is acquired with a longer TE. Okay. Any questions about this? What happens if I change this scenario by simply removing that 180 degree RF pulse? What type of pulse sequence is this now? It's a gradient echo pulse sequence. So all I've changed is that I have now made this a gradient echo pulse sequence. How does this affect the situation? We still have flow and stationary spins, but what happens when we apply our 90 degree RF pulse? Both of the flow and the stationary tissue are placed in the transverse plane. They both begin to relax to lose signal with T2 star. At some point TE we measure that signal. Whether those spins are still in the slice, the stationary spins, or they've moved on, the flowing spins, they're still both relaxing at the same rate and have a similar signal amplitude. So this idea of high velocity signal loss is dependent on the presence of that 180 degree RF pulse. Can you get artifact from um, the fact that the encoding steps take place at a different point in time? Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. We will get to that in shortly, not next, but we're, we're going to talk about that. But for now, I just want to talk about the signal, per se. Okay? So when we use a gradient echo pulse sequence, we will not see this high velocity signal loss. And if you look at your gradient echo images, you'll see that one of the characteristics of those gradient echo images is that we see signal in the blood vessels. Okay? Now, this high velocity signal loss is one reason why we might see low signal in a blood vessel on an MR image. And there are, there are two other reasons that I just want to go over briefly, one of which we'll address a little bit further later on.
So if we look at some image where we have blood vessels that are coursing through this image, and we know that there are all kinds of right, branching and bifurcations and twists and turns that these blood vessels may take. If we think about the nature of flow within a blood vessel, if it's something like the vena cava or the aorta, right, it's a relatively large, very straight, parallel walled structure, we get this sort of idealized pattern of flow where everything is moving in the same direction. And not only that, but it turns out that, and this will become important later on, that there's actually a distribution of flow velocities across the diameter of this vessel. This is called laminar flow, or in real life physiology, it's usually called plug flow, where the higher velocities of flow tend to occur in the center of the vessel, and there is a dramatic decrease in velocity as you get out to the periphery. But the main point I want to keep in mind here is that in this type of an idealized case, the flow is in these very parallel laminae. It's extremely organized, all going in the same direction. If we have a situation where flow comes down and hits, let's say, a bifurcation, So we might have, in this segment before the bifurcation, if this is the direction of flow, right, this highly organized laminar flow. When it comes to this bifurcation, because of the right, simple mechanical changes as well as changing direction of flow, we get a tremendous amount of disorganization of that blood flow in this area. Uh, things called turbulence or vortex flow. There are a whole bunch of different mechanisms and we're not really here to talk about that per se. But in this area, what happens that's of interest to us is that there is simply mechanical disruption of the organization of those flowing spins. And it turns out that in such a situation where we have this kind of turbulent flow, that the phase coherence of the flowing spins is also disrupted. <coughs> so whereas we might have used a gradient echo pulse sequence, which is not subject to signal loss due to high velocity flow. Okay. Nonetheless, even though we generated a large amount of coherent transverse magnetization, once that flow shows up and is subject to all of this turbulence and distortion, we will lose that phase coherence. Right? So due to that turbulence, there will be signal loss. And one of the things to always keep in mind is that turbulent flow, whether it's due to normal anatomy, right, like a bifurcation, or a tortuous blood vessel, or a blood vessel that's naturally tapering, or if it's due to pathology, like what? Stenosis, right? So stenosis is a great example, and we'll look at, at real-life applications of that in a little while. That type of turbulence leads to signal loss. Okay, so we have high-velocity signal loss when we're using a spin echo pulse sequence. can lead to low signal in a blood vessel. Turbulence is another one. The last mechanism has to do with something different. So if we have our example over here, let's say this is the abdomen, and we're looking at some segment of the splenic artery, which for convenience sake I made perfectly parallel to one of the dimensions of our image. In real life it wouldn't be that way, but it's going to make our lives easier. So this is a transverse slice through the abdomen. Right, the little the spleen would be over here, the liver is over here. So we have flow in this direction. We know that to spatially encode this image, we have to apply a gradient magnetic field. 
which we call the frequency encoding gradient. This frequency encoding gradient magnetic field means that if we consider what's happening with spins within a certain location, let's say within a voxel in the liver at that point. So <clears throat> the frequency encoding gradient magnetic field, first of all, in our pulse sequence, and to keep this simple, let's just think about a gradient echo pulse sequence. And I'm only going to show you, again, also to keep it simple, what's happening with the RF. Right at this point in time, we have to give some, let's say, a 90 degree RF pulse to generate our signal. At some time over here, TE, we're going to sample the signal. Let's look at what's happening with the frequency encoding gradient. So we know that it has to be on while we sample the signal. And that to generate our gradient echo, it has to be on with the opposite polarity beforehand. Okay. So let's consider, and I didn't really draw this to scale. It would actually look more like this. So that the equal opposite effect of the gradient magnetic field occurs at TE. So what I want to do is look at what happens to the stationary spins, let's say in the liver, under the influence of this gradient magnetic field by the time we get to, to TE. So if we think about two populations of spins that are living inside that same voxel. So within that voxel, there are some spins that are further to the left along this frequency encoding gradient and some spins that are further to the right. So when we turn on this initial dephasing lobe, those populations of spins will precess at different frequencies and we will have some loss of phase. Given that the gradient is applied with an equal and opposite magnitude and duration, we will recover that loss of phase at TE. So the net phase shift, so to speak, right, is zero at this point in time. And that's true for anything that's not moving. Right? And it turns out <clears throat> that the relationship between phase and these applied gradients is that the change in phase right, is directly proportional to the time that the gradient magnetic field is left on. So for one unit of time that we leave the gradient magnetic field on, we increment one unit of phase. For the next unit of time, we increment a second unit of phase and a third unit of phase, etc. So if we turn that gradient on for a fixed time period, and then we do the opposite thing for the same time period, we essentially have two equal and opposite effects. However, that's not true for spins that are moving. And we'll make an assumption that the velocity within this splenic artery segment here is first of all perfectly per parallel to the applied frequency encoding gradient magnetic field. But secondly, that it's constant velocity. Okay. In the presence of constant velocity, right, unidirectional flow, this relationship does not apply. Okay. And in fact, the relationship of the change in phase right, with constant velocity flow is to the square of time. Right. What that means is that if we make an assumption <coughs> that we have applied this gradient magnetic field, just to give it some parameter, for one unit of time, and then we apply it in the other direction for a second unit of time. So the amount of phase shift we get for a single unit of time is one unit of phase. But the amount of phase shift we have after two units of time is a total of four units of phase, which means that during this 
period of time we have a change of one unit of phase. During this period of time we actually have a change of three units of phase. That's the same as saying that we generate some signal and we knock them out of phase by one unit, whatever it happens to be. And then we turn on our gradient magnetic field with the opposite polarity. That means that instead of speeding these up, we're going to speed these up. But it has three times the effect as the first time around, which means it's not going to put them back into phase. It's actually going to keep going and they are going to be twice as much out of phase at this point in time as they were at this point in time. Did you say why that is again? Hmm? Did you say why that is again? So the reason that that occurs, that's the nature of the way phase changes with movement along a constant linear gradient magnetic field if you have a constant velocity. Now a way you could think about this is that as you move along this gradient magnetic field, the reason why we have an equal and opposite effect in the stationary case is because the spins are seeing exactly the same sort of net amount of gradient magnetic field. But remember that when the gradient magnetic field is on, as you move from place to place, the strength of that gradient magnetic field changes. So the amount of phase shift you have when you're in this location is not the same as the amount you have in this location or this location. So you're essentially accumulating additional amounts of phase as you move along the gradient magnetic field experiencing all of these different amounts of field strength. Okay? So how did you go from a change of, of one to... How do I get to this quadratic relationship as opposed to a linear relationship? How is that? Okay, uh, that's something that's been determined for constant velocity flow. The fact that it's constant velocity, by the way, is important. If there's any acceleration going on here, if there are any other types of motion, even this equation doesn't pertain. And there are other ways mathematically to describe what's going on. So I think for our purposes, we want to understand that just conceptually, that there is a difference in the amount of phase change that occurs per unit time in the presence of motion as opposed to when the spins are stationary. Okay. So as a result, what does the signal in the splenic artery look like at TE relative to the stationary signal in the liver? Anyone? Jane, what do you say? Given what we just said, that the stationary spins Right. What I've written in blue here is what's going on, that's not blue. What I've written in blue is what's going on in the presence of motion, constant velocity motion. What I've written in black, or let me do it in a different color, make it clearer. So in purple, we're going to have for this period of time, a change of one unit of phase. For this period of time, we are also going to have a change of one unit of phase. In, of course, in the opposite direction. So the stationary spins are knocked out of phase in one direction by a single unit of phase. Then they are knocked <coughs> with their phase in the other direction also by a single unit of phase. So the net effect on phase at TE is zero. Is that, is that clear why that is? Yes, no? Okay. But if we have this constant velocity motion, the first time we turn on the gradient magnetic field, we also decrease the phase by one unit. When we turn the gradient on in the opposite direction, though, it's three units of incremental phase that are applied, not one. So they are now pushed out of phase even further than they were at the beginning. Okay. So the relationship between phase is a quadratic relationship. One way for us to look at this is, you guys remember parabolas? 
That sound vaguely familiar? A bad memory? Right? So if this is time and this is phase, okay? So we have units of time, right? And we have units of phase. Now for stationary spins, we said that the change in phase right, is proportional to, directly proportional to time. Which means this is all under a constant linear gradient magnetic field in the absence of motion. So under a constant linear gradient magnetic field in the absence of motion, after one unit of time, we have a change of phase of one unit. After two units of time, we have a change in phase of two units. And after three units of time, a change in phase of three. Right? It's a linear relationship. However, if we invoke velocity, right, if there's motion, now all of a sudden, that change in, right, in phase, that wasn't meant to say change in velocity. That's supposed to be the change in phase. So the change in phase where we have constant velocity motion in the presence of a, gradient, a linear gradient magnetic field is proportional to the square of time. So after one unit of time, it's also one unit of phase change. After two units of time, though, it is four units of phase change. After three units of time, it would be nine, right? So this is going to look like quadratic. So the phase is changing much more rapidly over the same period of time. All right. What this means <coughs> is that if we observe and compare, now first of all, let's just get one thing straight. The change in phase that we see is directly reflected in the signal. Is that clear why that is? If we cause a phase shift in the spins, that means that the transverse magnetization is dispersed and there's less when we sum all of those vectors representing the transverse magnetization, there is a smaller net transverse magnetization. That's our signal. So if we cause any amount of change in phase, we are going to have less signal to detect. So if we now contrast what happens during a fixed period of time that we observe these spins. Well, if it's for one unit of time, regardless of whether we have motion or not, they look exactly the same. They've undergone one unit of phase shift, therefore they have, both have the same amount of loss of signal. So during this period of time, if we write in here how much of a change we get, right? We have a change of one unit for our stationary spins, and we also have a change of one unit for our moving spins. If we observe them for a total of two units of time, well, the stationary spins have accumulated total of two units of phase after two, two units of time observation. So therefore, the incremental phase change between one and two units of time is another one unit of phase. Okay? However, the moving spins, right, the, the moving spins during that two units of phase observation, of time observation, have accumulated a total of four units of phase, right? one of which was already accumulated during this first period of time. So we now have a change of three units of phase that occurs between one and two. So if we look at, compare everything that's going on at the end of two units of time, there is less signal from the spins that moved and that decrement in signal is all due to what happened between time one and time two. Okay? And 
this difference between these two would get progressively worse as time went on. Now, if we look at what happens during our pulse sequence, So the way the pulse sequence is designed there is a linear gradient magnetic field that's turned on in one direction and then turned on in the other direction. So that during this period of time we experience one unit or we could say negative one unit of gradient magnetic field. And then during this period of time, and TE would be over here, we experience positive right, one unit of gradient magnetic field. So given what we just said, the stationary spins see a, right, a change in phase of negative one during this period of time. It's a negative gradient magnetic field. And the amount of phase accumulation during one unit of time, as we said over here, is one. And during the second time observation, they also see a phase shift of one. But the gradient magnetic field is in the opposite direction. So this is right, plus one units of phase. So these two cancel each other out. The net phase accumulated by the time we get to TE is zero. But if we go back and look at what happens during the first unit of time observation for our flowing spins in blue, it's one. During that second period of time, it's three. So if we look at this and take into consideration the polarity or the sign of the gradient magnetic field, there is negative one units of phase. But over here, there is positive three units of phase. So when we get to time TE, there is a negative two units of phase, meaning there is a phase shift between spins that are moving, and there is no net phase shift for spins that are stationary. So therefore, the signal amplitude from our flowing spins is smaller than the signal amplitude for our spins that have not moved at all, okay? And this signal loss, right, this is our third example of how we can have low signal due to flow. Specifically due to flow along a gradient magnetic field, which by the way could be along the frequency encoding gradient. I made a very simple example here. It could equally be along the phase encoding gradient. And of course, flow is never perfectly parallel to the gradient magnetic field. Even if our flow direction looks like this, we essentially have two components of flow. It's flow velocity is a vector. So the component of that flow along the frequency encoding gradient will undergo this phase shift based on the frequency encoding gradient. The component of flow along the phase encoding gradient will undergo these phase shifts and signal effects based on the phase encoding gradient, yes. Will there be a time if we increase the, say if we increase the time of the linear gradient, would they come back to phase at any point? The, the if you just leave it on? Yeah. No. the time is more, no. they're going out of phase, and at any point will they come They will never come back into phase, no. No. Right. However, right, so we've seen here that if our gradient magnetic field is balanced, right, so we have an equal and opposite effect of that gradient magnetic field before TE, or what we called a gradient echo before. That does a great job of refocusing any phase that otherwise would have been lost in stationary spins. But it is not effective for causing a similar effect on flowing spins, which is why we will see this low signal. Okay. Now it turns out that there is a way for us to generate our image, right, where we have our flow and we have our stationary spins. And let's say, I don't want to have all that signal loss due to flow. And we'll talk about examples where you would want to see 
that signal due to flow. So is there a way for us to design the pulse sequence so that we can have both? And it can be done, and this has to do with understanding the nature of the way that phase is accumulated. Okay. So let's look at how we could possibly design our frequency encoding gradient so it would have no net effect on either stationary or flowing spins at time te. So this is the scenario that I want you to consider. Now, let's talk about the stationary spins first. So if these are our stationary spins, how much of a phase shift occurs at this point in time? Let's assume that on our time scale, each of these is one millisecond, let's say. Three equal units of time. And the way I've drawn this gradient magnetic field, the idea is that this represents one unit of gradient magnetic field strength, and this represents two units of gradient magnetic field strength. Okay. So when we apply one unit of gradient magnetic field strength for one unit of time, we get a delta phase that is one. And it's positive. Okay. When we apply it in the negative polarity for twice as much, we get a net amount of phase change that is minus two. And when we apply it then a third time, positive one, we have plus one. So if you look at the net amount of phase change, it sums to zero. What happens with the flowing spins? Well, for the first period of time, we have plus one. What about our second period of time? Okay, first of all, for two units of time, we have four units of phase. But this is double the strength. Okay, so this isn't negative four units of phase. This is negative how much? Okay, let's go back for a second. <laughs> Just want to make sure we're clear, okay? Two units of time is four units of phase, which meant during this increment, there were actually three units of phase accumulated. Okay, but this is done at twice the gradient strength. Okay, so where am I? This is negative six units of phase. Okay. I'm sorry. No. Well, that's, that's, that's it. We weren't talking about motion at that point. Okay. Okay? At that one, you're talking about a little bit further back, and we were talking, we were assuming that there was no velocity. Right? If there's any motion, then, then, that, that, then all bets are off. No. Right. Okay? So what happens during this next increment? Well, let's go back and look at our graph. We know that at three units of time, there is going to be how much? Nine. But four of those have already been accumulated. So this is an additional five. Okay? I'm not making it up. <laughs> and this is positive, so this is plus five. So the net amount of phase change at TE is zero for both flowing 
and stationary spins. You with us? Okay. <laughs> yes? No? No? Should we go over it again? Yes. Okay. As far as the stationary spins, you're okay with that? Yes. Okay. So we have three, let's, let's just clarify. Is this clear? Why this increments no. in phase of one, three, and five? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, my diagram is incomplete here, right? This is the square of time. So, for flow, right, this is constant velocity flow. So with constant velocity flow, we will increment an amount of phase proportional to the square of time. Which means that the amount of phase accumulated after one unit of time is one squared. Okay? One unit of phase during this time period. After two units of time, the amount of phase accumulated is two squared, is four units of phase. Meaning the total amount of phase accumulated after two units of time is four units of phase. We already know that one unit of that phase was accumulated during the first unit of time. So the second portion is three units of phase accumulated during the second unit of time. After three units of time, we have nine, but we've already taken care of four. So it's the additional five. So what you're seeing is that there is a constant, there's an acceleration, so to speak, of phase accumulation as time goes on. Okay? So does this make sense now? Yes. Okay. Okay, so this approach is called gradient moment nulling. Uh, it's sometimes called flow compensation. And it is a way for us to avoid signal loss due to motion along a gradient magnetic field. By the way, you know, just to like give some perspective, so this was figured out based on someone making a simple observation about MR images once upon a time. So there's someone named Bill Bradley who is in San Diego now. You guys may have heard about. He's kind of a famous person from the earlier days of clinical MR. He's a radiologist. And he actually found that when you look at images from a multi-echo, spin-echo acquisition, right, where you acquire your images at TEs of 20 and 40, let's say, milliseconds, right, multiples of each other, that he found that if you would look at areas where there were flow in those images, and I don't want to take the time to go through every detail here because it's going to take, it would take us a fair amount of time. We can, I'll be happy to do it during the break if you want. When he looked at flow in these images, he found that comparing the odd and even echoes that you would see low signal in that blood vessel on the odd echoes and the signal intensity would be higher on the even echoes. And this is something that he called even echo rephasing. And it turns out that the reason that this occurs, this even echo rephasing, is because when we finally get to the TE on the even echo, and we look at all of the gradients that have been applied, taking into consideration what we just talked about, the quadratic relationship between flow and phase shift, that it all accumulates, all adds up to zero at this point, where it's non-zero on the odd T's. And it actually turns out if you keep acquiring additional echoes, you have loss of phase on the odd echoes, and phase comes back on the even echoes. I mean, at this point, even echo rephasing is kind of a curiosity, but it's the basis for how we right, ultimately devise this approach called gradient moment nulling. Now that whole idea of phase accumulation 
due to motion is extremely important. It's, yes, it's information that we can look at the image and understand why there might be low signal in a vessel that is running in the plane of the slice. Right, if we have our image and we have some blood vessel that is running through this slice, we expect that there'll be low signal there due to movement along a gradient magnetic field. But this whole idea of gradients and how they affect the phase of moving spins is ultimately is the basis of something called phase contrast angiography, which we'll talk about and which we use for things like CSF flow and cardiac imaging. And it's also, in a sense, is the basis for the signal that we cha signal changes that we see related to diffusion, which we'll talk about tomorrow. Okay. So for now, I just want you to have this idea in your head that when there's movement along a gradient magnetic field, we are going to get signal loss. So we have three reasons when you look at an, an MR image and you see a blood vessel, which all the radiologists can look at it and say, I know that's a blood vessel based on the anatomy. We can say it's black, could be for one of three reasons. High velocity signal loss, that would only pertain if it was a spin echo image. You would never be able to say it's high velocity signal loss if you're talking about a gradient echo image. Right? Could be due to turbulence, and it could be due to this phase accumulation from movement in the plane of the slice along a gradient magnetic field. So any questions about those? Okay. Let's now talk about this situation. So here's an example of an image, which I'm going to just break up into some matrix of pixels. Obviously our images always have much higher spatial resolution than this, but this is just an example. Now if we have some blood vessel with flow moving along an oblique direction in this image. And we think about what's going on in the pulse sequence used to capture the signal and actually generate the image. So we know that we have our RF which is slice selective. We have to have a phase encoding gradient and a frequency encoding gradient and we sample the signal over here at TE. Yeah, and I haven't included all the, you know, dephasing lobes and all that stuff just for clarity. This is the information we need to understand what's going on. So given that we have flow through this vessel, let's look at a sample of spins which are in that location in the blood vessel at the time that we give the RF pulse, that we select the slice. And let's assume that this is the frequency encoding direction left to right in the image, and this is the phase encoding direction top to bottom. So the spins are in this location when we apply the RF pulse and generate the signal, they're constantly moving throughout the pulse sequence. Throughout the time that we are spatially encoding the signal and acquiring the signal, they are in motion. So, whereas they might be at this, loca at this point in time when they're at that location, by the time we get to, let's say, this point in time where we phase encode, they might be over here. And by the time we get to sample the signal at TE, maybe they're over here. What does that mean? 
Well, we've generated our signal while the spins were at this location. We have spatially encoded that signal along the phase encoding direction at this point. But our frequency encoding spatially encodes along the frequency encoding direction only at this location. So when that signal that we collect at TE gets run through our two-dimensional Fourier transform, where are we going to localize that signal? It's going to be localized to this pixel. Not the same place that it was when we phase encoded it. What if flow were in the opposite direction? Well, then it would actually be localized to the other side. Do you see why that is? No? Okay. So if we start out over here, when we excite those spins, and then if we are in this location when we phase encode, and then let's see, I'll just spread these out to make it a little clearer, if we are over here when we frequency encode. So we've localized to this point on the frequency encoding direction. But phase encoding occurred at this point in time. So we are going to place, right, them on that side of the vessel. That is if flow is in this direction. Okay. This is called phase misregistration. Whenever you have flow along an oblique direction within the plane of the slice, this is inavoidably going to occur. We'll look at an example of it. There's no way you can get around it. The only way you could potentially get around this is by adjusting your resolution. Or by adjusting your TE. If you image with a short enough TE, all of these things may occur before the spins can traverse enough distance to see this effect. On the other hand, right, if you sort of make your voxels big enough, then all of this will occur while they're still within one voxel. But at typical resolutions that we use for imaging, this is a very common effect. And in fact, if you know which direction is the frequency and which is the phase encoding direction, you can infer the direction of flow based on this artifact. Yes? So is this the same artifact that you mentioned a couple of days ago at the Aerda in this point? No. That's a different artifact. Be, and I'll, let me explain why, although we'll talk about that, that issue later on. This all occurs within a single TE. The pulsation artifact we talked about briefly, which we, we could address that now, is something else. Let's say, it doesn't even have to be the aorta, by the way. Let's say we're looking at the carotid. Okay? We're not trying to look at flow. We're just doing some structural image, sagittal image of the head, head and neck. And we're interested in imaging the area containing this blood vessel. Well, the heart, right, is pulsating away. And with every pulsation, there's movement in the carotid. Its diameter expands, it moves a little bit. So when we run through our pulse sequence, right, RF, TE, 
right, with phase encoding gradient over here, right, frequency encoding gradient on over here. We're going to run through this procedure and fill in the first line of case space. And then we're going to have to go back to the beginning and do this again and again and again. This occurs across many repetitions of the cardiac cycle. Right? At each point in the cardiac cycle, the carotid is in a slightly different position. Each of these lines of case space, we really have no way of controlling it, maybe it occurring at being acquired at all different points in the cardiac cycle, which simply means that each of these signals encodes different spatial information. So when we reconstruct our image, this information will be smeared. Let's assume that this is the phase encoding direction. That carotid will be smeared across this direction in the image. If we switch it and make our phase encoding direction the other way, we're going to see smearing in the other direction. Okay? So this is occurring across many acquisitions. The phase misregistration example here is not a motion artifact and it's occurring within a single TE. Okay? Okay, so when, so when, uh, you know, when you're, when you're reading the image and people are saying this is like a phase encoding artifact, they know that because they know the plane of phase encoding or is it just because the frequency encoding is always corrected? When they say a phase encoding artifact, like for that same example for like a pulsation. The one we were just looking at, a pulsation artifact like yeah, this? Yeah, a pulsation artifact, right. Well, why would we not see this in the frequency encoding direction? Simply because this period of time, frequency encoding is occurring during this period of, all the frequency encoding occurs during that period of time. That's a very brief period of time. It's brief enough that it's essentially fa it's happening faster than the motion is happening. So the frequency encoding process is not sensitive to this type of motion. But phase encoding is occurring over a very relatively very long period of time. I mean, minutes. So it's a tremendously sensitive to that motion. So similarly, when you look at an image, this is a little bit off the topic, but if you see that smearing going left to right, you know that the phase encoding direction of the image is left to right. right. Because we would never see that due to any effect on frequency encoding because it happens so quickly. Okay?